uh, well, uh, first let me thank uh, Urban for inviting me here. I'm very grateful to be in this lovely part of Spain and to lecture at the school. Uh, second, let me say that uh, Andre Chubukov will be a tough act to follow because he gave a truly inspiring pedagogical talk. And I am going to talk about something that we've been doing recently, so, but I will try to make it as pedagogical as we possibly can. Uh, I think one thing which is good is that uh, my perspective is uh, essentially complementary to Andre, so that may itself be good for the students to see how different ways of thinking about superconductivity. So, okay, so I will talk about uh, understanding limits on a superconducting disease, and I'll actually apply my results to a variety of interesting experimental problems. This is work done with my graduate students, uh, Hazda and Varma, uh, no relation to Chandra. And uh, 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 there's one paper which is just uh, appearing in the of X and some unpublished work. So here is my outline. I want to first motivate the problem, if actually it needs any motivation in this audience. Then I want to talk about some rigorous upper bounds of the superfluid stiffness and TC in two dimensions. And that's sort of mathematical physics, so then I will give you a slew of examples on two dimensional systems. I will talk about the challenges to deriving such rigorous results in three dimensions and then conclude. So let me use this picture from uh, the extraordinary work from the MIT group of Pablos, uh, which appeared last year. So on the y axis is the logarithm of the critical uh, temperature, on the x axis is the logarithm of the Fermi temperature. <coughs> And of course, as all of us know, you can hide a lot of sins in a log log plot. Furthermore, how to define the Fermi temperature in a strongly correlated or multiband system is also not entirely clear. But I'm just using this for motivation. And there's something striking about this plot. This is a Buemura inspired plot. All the BCS superconductors are down here. If you were to put this uh, hydrogen sulfide, it will also be down here. But what you see is that a lot of the interesting novel superconductors lie in bands which are very far from this regime, which raises the question, uh, why do we have this trend? And more importantly, what material parameters control TC? Because some of these are very different systems, magic and twisted biomedrapine, ultra-cold atoms, <coughs> a monolayer ion selenide, and so on. So what are the limits on TC? For instance, it looks from this plot that all known superconductors lie below some line like this. So could it be that some experimentalist comes and devises something which lies to the left of or above this line? Or is that forbidden by some general principle of nature? So those are the questions that I would like to address here. And so, in fact, these four <coughs> sets of systems which lie closest to the lines are ones that actually I'm going to focus on as we go on. So I don't need to say much about this, because uh, Andre did a very good job about it. So when I say BCS, I don't really mean uh, electron phonon interactions. For me, helium-3 is also uh, some kind of a BCS paired superfluid. But let's think in terms of the standard textbook picture. And TC is controlled by the collapse of the <coughs> amplitude of the superconducting water parameter, which is also related to an observable, which is the pairing gap, energy gap. And so TC scales with the pairing gap, which in turn depends on things like the Debye energy or some part of, and uh, the density of states of the chemical potential and the attraction. So uh, of course, as Andre uh, explained to you, that this sort of uh, BCS picture can be made much more sophisticated, uh, taking into account uh, retardation effects. This is the Eliashberg theory of the electron phonon interaction or indeed any other electron boson interaction provided a certain very important technical argument which does theorem about the separation of scales between the frequency the characteristic of this boson and the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy has to be much larger than the Debye or corresponding boson frequency. If that's true, then you can use the Selyashvar theory and the answers look much more complicated than the simple one and the full spectrum of excitations that mediate pairing enter uh, the answer. 
But nevertheless, this general aspect of a mean field theory remains that the pairing gap tells you how strongly the fermions are bound. And so you increase the pairing gap, you increase the TC distance. So this then leads to uh, the kind of feeling that experimentalists just hold on to, that if you have narrow bands, or even theorists, or if you're close to Van Hoe singularities, <coughs> then the density of states is huge. And the stronger the attraction, the higher the TC. Now, this actually, to my mind, is the tyranny of a very, very successful theory over decades and decades. Because as I try to convince you, this is not really always true. That if you try to push up PC using these kinds of ideas, then actually there are limits on the growth of PC, and PC just will not be able to rise above. So how can that be? So we have to remember that actually, if you have a scalar order parameter, it's a complex number. Uh, the beam field theory, BCS and Yashva framework, focuses on the amplitude of the order parameter, but there is this other degree of phase of the order parameter. So how does the phase of the order parameter enter into it? So for instance, if you have fluctuations of the phase of the order parameter, the free energy density is governed by the superfluid stiffness. Okay? This is like elasticity theory, that if you try to make a strain in the displacement field, then basically there's some elastic stiffness that controls the energy. And this also is related to a very well-known experimental observable. So in three dimensions, the London penetration that one over that squared, this is directly proportional to the superfluid stiffness. So the fluctuations of the phase of the superconducting order parameter are controlled by this stiffness. <laughs> and uh, there are at least two very well-known examples of TC being controlled by the superfluid stiffness. The first is the berezinsky postulates thalys theory, about which we will have more to say later on in two dimensions. And the second was the observations of uh, Uemura using mu SR for a scaling of this sort, and the pioneering work of Emery and Kivelson, about which we will also have more to say towards the end of the talk. So one of the things that uh, we must understand, I'm uh, trying to understand limits on TC, is to understand who wins and when. OK, very good. <coughs> so now let me uh, talk about the first technical aspect of what we want to do, which is to get an upper bound on the superfluid stiffness of any material. <coughs> and when I say any system, I really want to study uh, multiband superconductors with arbitrary interactions. So I'm going to write down a very general Hamiltonian. So the kinetic energy is just the dispersion of the electrons, where k lives in the first Renault zone, m is a band index, and sigma is spin. I could easily include spinomial coupling here, but since I'm trying to do something new, let's not get involved in more okay? So this basically describes the low energy band structure of the energy states that are going to be affected by superconductivity. And I exclude the bands which are deep below, fully occupied, or well above, and totally empty. Now what about the interaction? So I'm going to make very few assumptions about the interactions. You can include electron phonons, you can include electron electrons, you can include electron bosons, and the results are going to be independent of the nature of interactions, bearing mechanism, and symmetry. So how am I going to get away with this? Well, what I want to compute is the superfluid stiffness, right? So that's the response to a vector potential. So I'm going to make the assumption that in the presence of an external vector potential, if I were to write down a tight bounding parameterization of these bands, <coughs> then the hopping matrix elements, T alpha, beta r, which takes you from a orbital or site alpha to a site beta from one unit cell to another, or maybe even within a unit cell, separated by a distance r, that picks up a pile space factor. So the only assumption I'm making about the interactions is that the external vector potential doesn't couple to the interaction. Okay. This is certainly true for electron phonon interactions, for a Hubbard model, for a TJ model, for many, many, many Hamiltonians that all of us love to study. But when the phonon is just hopping. So we can always write down, I can give you counter examples, but these are not the ones that routinely everyone studies. And I'm certainly not going to make any mean field approximation 
So I feel this is a reasonable starting point. It's a reasonable point. Okay, yes. I'm just saying. Yes. I, I, can like that, I can give you many examples. For right. instance, if ring exchange were extremely important to you, you'd pick up, uh, for instance, uh, vector potential dependence and interaction. I'm not going to study those. Up. I'm going to study this. You want to prove a theorem, you have to decide what class of this. I'm not objecting to your proof, but let's say the R in a proof. Yes, 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 I said that myself. Yeah. Yes, OK. So we will study translationally invariant systems because disorder is very easy to incorporate here and not. So here's the upper bound that we're going to get. So we're going to upper bound the superfluid stiffness by an object B tilde, which I will define and give you an intuitive feeling for. So this bound will be valid in all dimensions and for arbitrary interactions. And of course, the whole point is that B tilde is simpler to compute than the superfluid stiffness. So how does this go? Technically, if you're an experimentalist, you can ignore everything below the line. I'm going to give you a very good intuitive picture for what's going on. <coughs> so since we want to compute the stiffness, we do linear response to an external vector potential. We write down a Kubo formula for the transverse current current correlation function. I get a diamagnetic piece. I get a transverse paramagnetic current current correlation. <coughs> Using the Lehmann representation, you can show that this paramagnetic current current correlation is positive definite. Therefore, if I ignore this, the diamagnetic piece gives you an upper bound on Ds. So what did all this mean in physical terms? OK, the intuitive picture is the following. If you have a superconductor, it will have an optical conductivity. And because it's a superconductor, it will have a delta function. The weight of the delta function is Ds. I'm ignoring obvious factors. Okay? And then there is some other structure about which I know very little a prior. But what else? This inequality is actually the statement that the weight in this delta function has to be less than the total spectral weight of the low energy bands that I discussed in my kinetic energy, because this total spectral weight includes the delta function. So obviously, this must be true. Now what I have to do is I have to tell you how to compute Tilde and why it's much more easy to estimate compared to Ds. Okay, so here is a general formula that you can write down for D-tilde for a multiband with arbitrary interactions. And after we derived it, we discovered that uh, many of the people who are in the audience have also arrived at a similar formulation in for ion-based superconductors. So now, this looks pretty bad. So let me explain what each term in here is. OK, so we know h bar, omega is just the volume or area of the system. So we have an inverse mass tensor, and we have a density matrix. So the inverse mass tensor, the inverse mass tensor obviously knows something about the curvatures of the bands. And that's why it's the second derivative of the hopping matrix element Fourier transform to k space with a derivative with respect to k squared. And what are these uh, matrices used? Well, if you know, if you've just taken the hopping matrix uh, here, T alpha beta, then the u's are the unitary transformation that diagonalize this to give you the bands. So here, you don't just take b2 epsilon dk squared, but you first take this second derivative and then rotate it into band space. Now, why is this a, this looks like an awful thing, but why is it simple? So the simple thing is that this object, the inverse mass tensor, depends only on the band structure and on nothing else, right? It has no dependence on the interactions. It has no dependence on temperature. Whereas this density matrix, C dagger C, it depends in general both on interactions and temperatures. Where does this, these dependencies come from? It comes from the fact that this is an expectation value of C dagger C with respect to the full Hamiltonian, tracy to the minus beta h divided by C. Okay, so that's where it is. So we've sort of decoupled and found something which comes only from the band structure, and at least something which is akin to a momentum distribution, but not quite because it's off-diagonal band space, which is just a C dagger C. Okay, so so far that was the superfluid density. Now I need to find you an upper bound of PC. For much of the talk, I'm going to focus in two dimensions, returning to 3D at the end of the talk. From now on, let's look at two dimensions. Okay, so in two dimensions, uh, there is a very famous result in BKT theory 
which was first derived by Nelson and Hustlers, which said that the transition temperature in BKT theory is just related to the superfluid density just below the transition temperature. And in fact, this universal result has been tested numerous times, and I think but for this famous experiment of Bishop and Deppi, probably Hustlers and Thalys wouldn't have gotten the Nobel Prize, because it's the most striking experimental evidence for Hustlers and Thalys. But now we have found a bound on the superfluid density. So therefore, we get a rigorous upper bound on the TC. Now we say, uh, this is just an equation. It has TC on this side. Does TC on that side? Is it useful? Of course, the rest of the talk is going to try to tell you why this is useful. But at least this bound is independent of pairing mechanism and pairing symmetry, so long as we have a BKT transition. And actually, perhaps more generally, if you look at the original paper of Postulis and Thalys, they argue that their estimated TC is itself an upper bound on the actual TC. Because for instance, if for some reason the fugacity was not small, you couldn't do the Postulis RG, and some first order transition took place, that would happen before KT would happen. If nothing else happened, KT happens, okay? In any case, this is where we are. Now, one thing I do want to uh, make uh, very uh, emphasize is that we have made really no assumptions about the interactions, and we have certainly not made any main field approximations. But because this uh, right hand side depends on TC, uh, let's try to do some more mathematical physics and get an answer further bounding it, which doesn't depend on TC. And you can do some triangle and Cauchy Schwartz and so on, and show that that second derivative in phase space is related to a second moment in real space. And what this shows you is, and this should not come as a surprise to anyone, that when you have low densities, then the total optical spectrum rates will be small. If you have narrow bands, then the total optical spectrum rates will be small. But if the tiller is going to be small, the TC is going to be small, no matter how strong the attractive interactions. So that's what we want to study, exactly how this plays out. And conversely, we will find that, oh, find that although the bound is valid everywhere, it will be of little use when BCS theory works. But then BCS theory works. OK, so now, uh, a result is only good, as good as the insights you can get for specific systems. So I will go through a list of examples uh, of increasing complexity. Yeah. So, being a good theorist, I first start with a spherical car. So, let's take a single parabolic band in two dimensions because you can't find a simpler example. The dispersion is k squared. I have a density of particles n, a Fermi energy, and I will let you put in any interaction on this band that you want. Okay? Except for the uh, fact that. Uh, the uh, vector potential couples only to the dispersion. So the first inequality, the ds is bounded above by d tilde, is a very trivial inequality, that the superfluid density is less than the total density. You can't fight for it. The second inequality is very surprising. It says, no matter what you do, Tc can never be more than <coughs> 1 over 8 depths in the first. Now, I'm actually... I was kind of surprised to see that this elementary result, which could have been derived decades ago, had never been derived. And Andre chided me that I should have derived it decades ago. Uh, we kind of saw it, but we didn't see it as a general bound, at least, for any arbitrary Now, if I wanted to cheat, which I do not, I could just draw a straight line here with an intercept of 1a and declare some sort of victory. The reason why that victory would be very unfair is because very few of the systems here are 2D parabolic bands. So I certainly do better as I go along. But like all spherical cows, it's a very useful spherical cow. Because it does tell you that there is a bound on TC which scales like with epsilon 30. So the next question might be, where might I check this experiment? So I'm going to give you an answer in cold atoms, and I'm also going to give you an answer in solid state. So for the students, one slide introduction to cold atoms. So uh, in cold atoms, people have looked at uh, a quadratic dispersion uh, in a gas of neutral fermions, and the two systems which have been studied are lithium-6 and potassium-40. 
But here, one has a luxury one doesn't have in the solid state that you can tune the attraction through what is called the Feshbach resonance. And you can go all the way from BCS theory of very large overlapping pairs to a Bose Einstein condensate of diatomic molecules. And this problem is not just a theorist problem. Uh, here is uh, uh, the Abrikosov vortex lattice uh, going from uh, this goes towards BEC, that goes with BCS. This was Martin's YLSVH, but this is nothing but part of the D. Uh, this actually also happens to be from Zylein's group. This is a measurement of the specific heat singularity at the unitary point, which is the most strongly interacting regime. And you can see that they see the superfluid transition specifically. So there are numer numerous experiments here. Most, but not all, experiments are for three D Fermi gases, which we will come back to. Right now, we want to focus on the two D case. Okay? So for the two D case, we have a sharp prediction. Uh, which is given here, and I believe this can be tested in the current experiments and current Monte Carlo simulations, and nobody has just done either of these to test this. So here is a picture of the PC versus an attractive interaction. And the attractive interaction has a log of the, the two-particle bound state divided by Fermi energy. This is the 2D log uh, that I worked on in my childhood and Andre referred to. But if you don't know about it, it doesn't matter, okay? This is just an attractive interaction. Extreme here is very weak coupling of BCS theory. Extreme there is very strong coupling. And so in the BCS limit, we know how to calculate everything at PC grows like this and would keep on growing. It would keep on growing linearly, actually, as it turns out, and have an essential singularity down here. But the BEC limit is also known because actually, it turns out that the effective repulsion between bosons becomes weaker and weaker as you go out there. And if you really had non-interacting bosons in 2D, that TC would go to zero. But it actually goes to zero extremely slowly. Uh, and it's no surprise that a Russian physicist got the double log on, on how it goes down. Okay? So we know this asymptote. We know that asymptote. And the blue curve that I've drawn is just an artist's conception. Okay? No one has actually done a seamless calculation, and our bound is here, 0.1 to 5, 1.8. And I believe that there is every reason to believe that in the strongly interacting regime of the 2D BCS to BEC crossover, you will come very close to saturating this bound. That's a prediction. OK, now, before going to experiments, let me go to a model system. Uh, because at least this will tell us what to expect when you have a non-parabolic dispersion. So let's take the 2D attractive Hubbard model. This is a prior model where you have attraction on site, very different from the repulsive systems that Andre was talking about. And so you just get a superconduct, S wave superconducting ground state at any filling away from half filling. And if I have hopping uh, on the nearest neighbors on a square lattice, then I get this familiar cosine k, so this cosine k by dispersion. And the bound looks uh, very simple. Because now you just get d2 epsilon dk squared as the momentum distribution. Okay. In fact, it turns out that for the case of nearest neighbor hopping on a square or hypercubic lattice, this thing becomes the kinetic energy, which is why often people call this the kinetic energy. But in general, to call this the kinetic energy is actually extremely misleading. Okay, but here that's true. So now, what are we going to compare our bound to? So fortunately, we have exact quantum uh, Monte Carlo results here because this model has no fermion sign problem. So we can really compare bound to the answers that we know from quantum Monte Carlo. So this is quantum Monte Carlo that uh, I was involved with, which was done by Richard Scalatan and Dimitri Vedi several years ago. And this is TC in units of the hopping matrix element. Here is the attraction in units of the hopping matrix element. This is the quantum Monte Carlo TC, shown here. This is the BCS theory answer. Okay, and now what does our bound say? So for the bound, we will say something about N of K. So if I wanted to be a mathematical physicist, the only thing I can say about N of K is N of K is less than 1, if it's a Fermi system. In that case, I'll get a U independent bound, which is somewhere up here, which is still better than BCS mean field theory, which goes up. Okay? But I can do something a little bit better. I can use Leggett's famous mean field theory of the BCS BEC crossover to tell me what N of K does. 
And that's an estimated bound. And if I do that, this is what the bound does as a function of interaction. It recovers the right t squared over u asymptotic limit and gets a much uh, tighter estimate of the actual TC in the intermediate to strong coupling regime. So there are uh, two lessons to get from this kind of a plot. One is that the actual TC is the minimum of the mean field theory TC and the one that we get from the bound. Okay? And when mean field theory works, this is a much better. Any mean field theory is actually an upper bound. But that upper bound, any mean field theory upper bound, will depend upon all kinds of assumptions and parameters. The nice thing about this is that this, in general, depends only on band structure. Okay? And also, it says that our bound is useful precisely where mean field theory fails, i.e., away from the mean coupling BCS. OK, with that in mind, let me turn to uh, a material of interest to many of us, monolayer I-79 on STO. So here is a system where the bulk PC is around 10,000 or so. But as everyone in this room surely knows, that when instead of looking at bulk, uh, when people made one layer of uh, iron salamine and SEO, the PC shot up. And the numbers in the literature range from 65 to 109 Kelvin. I'm not talking about the PC measured from photo emission or uh, SEM, because that just shows the opening of a gap, which may have nothing to do with PC. But these are at least magnetic or uh, resistive transitions measured. So here is a paper uh, from the Chinese group. Uh, is also there, and many others are there which gives you 109. And there's a very nice experiment to review by Jenny Hoffman uh, a couple of years ago. So you can look that up. So what are we going to do here? So here is a situation where we have very little idea of what the pairing mechanism is. In the bulk, I think everyone believes that it's electron-electron interactions. What does STO and the monolayer do? Well, the monolayer changes the electronic structure completely. And at least initially, there was a strong argument made by many that the STO provides substrate phonons that boost the PC. But George Savatsky has challenged that interpretation. And I think the jury is open on what the mechanism is. But this is where our bound is in great shape, because we don't care about the mechanism. Okay? So we can use electronic structure as input for our bound. We could either use DFT, or we could use RPS. So let's use RPS. Okay? So if we use RPS, so here is the uh, two ion per unit cell uh, Brinhaus zone shown here. And you have these two bands crossing the chemical potential uh, near the end point. Unlike bulk ion selenide, there's no action near the gamma point. OK, so since these are rather tiny pockets, you can just do k dot p perturbation theory about these end pockets. And uh, since they are tiny, I'm going to ignore any k cube spin orbit coupling term, which will greatly simplify my analysis just to get a first pass at what the answer would be. And uh, so actually, Andre pointed out to me that uh, I should actually uh, refer a paper by uh, Oscar Waffet uh, as the, having done these kinds of uh, perturbation theories originally. But there it is. Now, what do we have to do? Uh, using this 2 by 2 matrix, we can calculate the uh, inverse mass tensor. And because you take a second derivative, uh, the spin orbit coupling actually vanishes uh, from this simple calculation. And the two bands decouple. And we get an answer which is just 2 times 1 8 epsilon per Okay, So we get a very simple answer that TC has to be less than 164 Kelvin. You can change the parameters a little bit. I mean, if you had taken DFT, for instance, of uh, the Berkeley group, then we would have gotten an answer of around 200 Kelvin. So we get pretty sensible numbers uh, of 30 by a factor of 2, but without making any assumptions at all about the nature of the interactions. OK, so while I'm at it, why not go to the most interesting <coughs> uh, recently discovered superconductor of all, magic and of crystal by the graphene. I think tomorrow there'll be a full session. So let me just say, for those of you who are in Spain, probably there's no one who doesn't know about it. But I think there's no one in the world who doesn't know about this. Uh, when you twist uh, two layers of uh, graphene, you get extremely narrow bands uh, at near magic angles. And then interactions uh, have a huge and unexpected impact in these uh, narrow bands. That they would have some impact was obvious, but that they would lead to the phenomena that they do was not predicted. 
So you get these correlation-induced quote-unquote modern oscillators at fillings where band theory said there would be a metal. And near those locations, uh, near the modern oscillators, if you go slightly away on either side using dating, you see superconducting. So here, the pairing mechanism is also extremely unclear. For obvious reasons, the fact that uh, twisting is so important means that phonon, electron-phonon interaction must be strong. Also the fact experimentally that pressure is very important as shown by the Columbia UCSV groups means that the electron-phonon coupling must be very strong. On the other hand, because you have insulators that commensurate feelings, electron-electron interactions are also very strong. So we don't know what it is. But our bound is truly agnostic about this mechanism. So we only need the band structure to calculate this. Now, actually it turns out that the non-interacting band structure, non-interacting band structure of this material is also still under activity. But uh, I will take here, for the purposes of illustration, uh, the tight binding fit of Oshino and Liang Fu published last year in PRX which is a tight binding fit to the original continuum model prediction of this crystal and McDonald. Okay? And I'm very happy to discuss with you how the numbers change if instead I take the Kang and Raffet dispersion, for example. So, okay, so here you have eight bands because you have a two-fold Bali degeneracy, a two-fold layers, or shouldn't call it degeneracy there, but two from Bali, two from layer, and two from spin. And we take, take into account uh, M will go from 1, 2, 3, 4, and the spin rate, okay, so it, and, and we'll take the spin rate to see which is the from 2. So what do we get? So what we'll do is, uh, we'll just compute this uh, inverse mass matrix uh, from the Koshino Fu dispersion. Now, that's fine, we can get the inverse mass matrix. What am I going to do about this, uh, this density matrix? So for a minute, I'm going to play mathematical physicist, okay, and say I don't know anything about it. So I'm going to use a triangle inequality by saying that d tiller is a positive definite object because it's the sum rule of a dissipative response function. So then I can use the triangle inequality because I don't a priori know about the signs of these objects, that's why, right, okay. Then I will use a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in the space of operators. Then I will use the fact that momentum distribution is less than one. And all of these are completely rigorous things. And so I get the answer that I have an upper bound. I'm actually making this upper bound weaker and weaker and weaker, but doing it rigorously. If I just do that, I get an answer of 56. Okay, because I've weakened this upper bound considerably. Now you can say, okay, stop being mathematical physicist. You are just a real physicist, which I hope I am. Okay. So I'm going to take some input from experiments. <coughs> okay? So we know from Pablo's work that the Mach gap is about a third of a millivolt. And I think uh, if anything we have learned from things like the cube rates is that the superconducting gap is going to be less than the Mach gap. Okay, so I'm going to make that assumption. If the superconducting gap is less than the Mach gap, then the superconducting gap when I'm near half filling down here, for instance, is definitely going to be less than this half the band. So in other words, I'm going to assume that when superconductivity happens around half filling down here, the bands above are not going to be impacted by superconductivity, an assumption I did not make over here. Okay, now I'm going to do that. If you do that, then after a sequence of algebra, which is all exact, you can show that only the M equals M prime terms uh, contribute to this. This is not at all an obvious statement, but it leads to a great simplification. And when you put in just those M equals M prime terms here, you've dropped a lot of terms and TC is bounded above by 15 terms. Okay? And finally, I can even do a simpler estimate, which may or may not be a good one, which is to say, look, I got the inverse mass matrix from band theory. So why don't I drop all pretenses and even take this density matrix from band k? If I do that, then of course, the, if I get this from band k, this is the Fermi function, which is diagonal in the band index. Then I get an answer of 6 here. Okay? And the highest reported TC is by the Columbia UCSD groups uh, of 3 Oh, sorry. So that's all I want to say about two dimensions. 
Now, given everything that we have learned in two dimensions, now you can say, why don't you just go to Trump and find bounds in three dimensions? Excuse me. So, let me proceed. So although our bound on the superfluid density is valid in all dimensions, the relationship between Tc and the superfluid density was a universal number only in two dimensions. And that's because you have this universal amplitude ratio coming from nelson coslitz In three dimensions, the superfluid density does not have dimensions of energy, unlike in 2D. And that you can just see from here, that in two dimensions you get two factors of length from here, two factors of length from there, and ds has the same units as the free energy. But in three dimensions, there's going to be an extra length scale there. So that's going to complicate my life. And this complication was, of course, realized by Marie and Kibbelson in their pioneering work. So KVTC was the superfluid density tying this extra length scale and then a non-universal factor. So this is the cutoff. And Emery and Kibbelson said, there is a very physical way to choose this cutoff. Because if you want to describe your system by an XY model, what you need to do is take your microscopic system and coarse grain it up to a coherence length scale. Now you can define a local order parameter and discuss it in terms of the fluctuations of the phase of the order parameter. So that's why, because of this uh, coarse graining, they basically said that this length scale A bar should be the coherence length C0 in this way. And then Emily and Kibbelson used uh, numerical results from uh, classical 3D XY Monte Carlo simulations and also some experimental constraints to argue that this coefficient was 4.4. And then using this, they could relate uh, the phase fluctuation PC mm -hmm. to the superfluid. But post Emery and Kivelson, other experiments came. So for instance, the 3D DCS to BEC crossover experiments in Juan Monte Carlo arrived. Okay? Uh, and then you know precisely what this uh, uh, correlation length should be near unitarity and its KF inverse. Because at the unitary point, basically, the pair size is comparable to interparticle spacing. And from experiments and quantum Monte Carlo, we know that the maximum PC over epsilon Fermi around here, just to the right of unitarity, is actually 0.22. And if you stick that in here, this suggests that alpha is equal to 7.4, about a factor of two higher than the median phase. So then the open question is how to bound this non-universal free factor alpha? And I think we don't know the answer at the present moment. If you're willing to just take empiricism, then you know where it should be. Now, one question that is often asked is, does the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature give you an upper bound on the superconducting uh, transition temperature? And the answer to that question is a resounding no, okay? Because there is a rigorous upper bound due to Seidinger and collaborators. And Seidinger has many papers on both gases that then get lead, so he's, in, he's a rigorous mathematical physicist, showing that repulsive interactions enhance the PC of a dilute Bose gas. So therefore, repulsive interactions enhance the PC in both systems over the non-interacting 3D PDC result. And what implications does this have for fermions? So again, if you look at the BCS BEC crossover, then in the extreme BEC limit, uh, we would have a set of bosons of mass 2m and a density which is n over 2, n is the fermionic density. So refer to the bare Fermi energy, Tc would have been about 0.218 epsilon Fermi when you put in all of these v w over 2 and so on and so forth. And what the Seidinger result says is that Tc must increase, so it must increase by how much it doesn't say as you come towards unitarity. And of course, from this side, we have BCS theory. So it seems to suggest that you will get a hump. And indeed, uh, both experiments and quantum Monte Carlo suggest that you do have a maximum PC, which within error bars is very close to the BEC temperature, but slightly large. Okay. So the next question one can ask is, 
is it really true that we're just fighting over a factor, whether it's 4.4 or 7.4, or could there be a more uh, fundamental problem with three dimensions? So while all of us, of course, want to understand how high DC can be, if you want to prove a bound, okay, then that bound should work everywhere, no matter how low or high TC is. Now there is a problem, because actually it comes out that the linear scaling between TC and the superfluid density must fail near a 3D quantum critical point at which superconductivity disappears. This is probably not the kind of quantum critical point that Andre is talking about and many are interested in, but anyway, I, under doping in cube rates, actually there's very strong evidence that I'll show you that there is such a quantum critical point and over doping too. Okay, so if I have a quantum critical point at which TC goes to zero and the superfluid density goes to zero, then scaling just tells you that it must go to zero in this particular fashion, where Z is the dynamical critical exponent and U is the correlation length exponent at that quantum critical point, and delta is the deviation from that quantum critical point. So if we eliminate delta, we find a quantum Josephson scaling which says that TC and the superfluid density scale in the following fashion. If I'm in two dimensions, then this V minus two cancels, no matter what Z, Z cancels, and everything I showed you works even near quantum critical points. But if I'm in three dimensions, then I'm in trouble, because Z over Z plus one means that you do not have uh, TC scaling linearly with DS in three dimensions. Now if the experimentalists here feel, uh, oh, this is some scaling mumbo jumbo, so let me just immediately put up data. So here I show you data on the same log PC log EF plot that I showed you from Pablo's group, and I've superimposed on that. So everything was falling along this DC scaling like Epson Fermi uh, data from Tom Lemberger. Uh, but of course, similar data at underdog cube rates have been found also by the UPC group. And now there's also similar data on the overdog side showing that DC scales like the square root of the superfluid density. Okay, which is a D equals three, Z equals one in the story. So uh, if you, so there's going to be no general result of the kind I'm talking about. So to summarize the story, if you want to understand these trends uh, in TC versus a Fermi temperature, we have the problem under complete control in two dimensions, as I hope I've convinced you. And in three dimensions, the story is much more, uh, I mean, there we have to qualify things much more. So, so long as one is not close to a quantum critical point at which superconductivity is destroyed, we have a, a bound on TC, but that bound on TC contains a cutoff and a non universal pre factor, and I think it's an open question as to how to completely bound this non universal pre factor. Okay, so let me end. And let me focus on the, um, uh, just reminding you of what I've shown you. So what I've shown you is an exact upper bound in the superconducting PC, irrespective of mechanism, in two dimensions. It's dependent on symmetry, mechanism, and strength for a PKT transition, and basically says that TC cannot grow more than the tilde related to the optical conductivity spectral weight, which is simpler to estimate, and is dominated by band structure. For a parabolic band, we get a very simple uh, result that TC can just never exceed one inch at cylinder Fermi. For multiband superconductors, uh, we need to go through the calculation case by case and evaluate the bound. But I showed you that we get very useful results for monolayer ion selenide and STO and for magic angle crystal barrier and graphene. So if you were to take away some qualitative messages, where is this bound useful? It's useful when you have low densities. It's useful when you have narrow bands. It's useful when you have strong correlations. And it's useless when these CS and LDH work. Okay. So let me end with that. Thank you very much. Yes. And this energy is larger than EF. Yes. 
them uh, up to logs. Yes. Mean field TC or DC TC is this bound state formation temperature. I'm yes. I'm sure that it's EF in numerator there, not another scale. No, that is EF in numerator. Uh, absolutely, sir. What you said is right, Andre. That so, so here, I think for those of you who don't know what's going on here, it's the following. The two dimensions is very special. Uh, did I come to answer your question? Uh, in that, an arbitrarily weak interaction, attraction, will lead to the formation of a bound state even in the absence of a Fermi Okay, And then it has a binding energy, E sub B. And so the nature of the attraction is encoded in log of that binding energy E sub B divided by the Fermi energy. What Andre is asking me is if I did a fermionic mean field theory, then in that fermionic mean field theory, the BCS result, which is going like this, would eventually go to EB up to some log corrections coming from uh, entropic effects. Okay? And uh, I dropped something. But, uh, but that's the fermionic. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's the scale at which the pairs will dissociate. This is the scale at which the pairs will condense. And the scale there is set by the density, which is not surprising. Yes? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Let me say, uh, it yes. uh, it's about the same plot, but I'm wondering whether it can be even more stronger in your favor. Okay. That suppose that B and EF are of the same order. Yes. Log is close to zero. Yes. Then, uh, if you calculate uh, mean field transition temperature, it will be much larger than one eighth of EF. Yes. So in other words, can it be the blue line hit red one, and then over some range you have a red line as the upper, as the actual PC. So it's it could, I see, I, this is a guess. So mm -hmm. this, these can certainly, I think this can become one eighth. I don't know, but it can certainly not go about. Right, right, right. I was wondering whether there is really region when you have this sharp boundary at one eighth. It would be hard for me to say that based on what I do. That would be nice, it's true. It could be, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, just on, on this plot, so in three, if you had this in 3D, yes. in the lower bound to TC, the answer you'd get from just simple statistical mechanics. No, actually, it's very hard to get lower bounds on TC. Because if you got, gave me a lower bound on any system, then you would have rigorously proven that the ground state is a superconductor. But that's a hard thing to do. You can get lower bounds from mean field theory, but that's a separate story. General lower bounds are very hard to get in super densities of these things. Is uh, bulk strontium titanate on your log log block? Bulk strontium titanate. Yeah. Log TC, log TR. Uh, here it is. I see. Actually, I can show you our estimates for LAOSGO, which is a two dimensional superconductor. And what we find there uh, is that. Our bound overestimates the TC of LAOSTO by three orders of magnitude, which is not surprising. LAOSTO is also down. It basically says that from this perspective, whatever the mechanism, it's deep in the BCS. I see. Okay. And I can show you the details of that estimate. And does strategically, does your global picture imply that we should be searching for materials with very small effective mass near the chemical potential? So it's a very good question, and thank you for asking me. Uh, I think what it says is the following, that if you have a one-band system, then if, the, if you have a very high effective mass, you're going to be in trouble energy. But if you have a multi-band system, okay, let's say a two-band system, maybe one should try to even scape and have it too. <laughs> Namely, you could have a very flat band in which the BCS pairing gives you a very large delta. Okay? But then you would say that band has a very small superfluid density. But there's something else which provides you a large superfluid density. <coughs> and then you may have best of both worlds. Actually, that's the last sentence of our paper. <laughs> but the best should be of the same uh, sign. 
involved should be elected from that as from Polish. Yes, I think there are many things to explore here as to how to optimize things in multi -dances. Because Andre is right, because he has studied, motivated by the nicktides, uh, a really compensated semi metal. And then, you know, very different things happen. So, yes. Yes. Wonderful story. You made the statement that um, the mean field TC is always. An upper bound. Yeah. Is that really a true statement? So I. It sounds perfectly plausible, but is it actually true? So I don't know if I can prove it at the level at which I do, mm -hmm. but at the physical argument level, I think it's fine. Uh, the reason is that in mean field theory, you make lots of assumptions. That's why proving it even at the level of rigor that I do yeah. is harder. But I think every experience we have shows that that's true. Oh, no, we had just do, seen you, the repulsive interaction story where some sort of fluctuations are even responsible okay. for superconductivity to begin with. Fine, yeah, so the question is what we call mean field. Yeah, so there's exactly. a question of what we call mean field. So if yeah. you do a sophisticated enough mean field theory on a sophisticated enough effective model, that, can live, then yeah. physically yeah. it's right. But I didn't write that down really. I mean, I was just showing it in the context of some right. simple model. But yeah, you're right. That's that's why mean field theory bounds are iffy, whereas this one uh, no. is not. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, my question is on the um, starting uh, non-interactive model from the one we do a start from and the bounds. And uh, so the question is: Is it obvious that you can just uh, throw away the the, the field bound on the empty bound and um, so I and whether you cannot whether you uh, my question is whether you get uh, this is telling you something about the bound structure and I'm going to tell you why I say this yes um, in this bilateral I've seen a recent paper uh, they do it not with an effective model but with continuum model from graphene and and they claim that uh, there are contributions to the superfluid stiffness that are not coming from the flat band, but involve all the bands. Okay. So my question is whether this is really something on the effective model that we have to use or something. Okay, so first of all, I think there are problems with that particular reference, but let's not go into nitpicky uh, details. I think this is a general question about all of condensed matter physics, right? You're asking, when am I allowed to use an effective model, and what is a good effective model? It's a very hard question to give a uh, sort of one-size-fits-all answer to, right? Uh, I think this is something we have to learn, and we try it, and if it works, uh, we declare victory. If it fails, we include more bands. Okay, that's just the way life goes. But I think uh, we can, even a prior, right, uh, ask what the relevant energy scales are, right? Because I mean, it's like saying that if you want to study some phenomena in aluminum, can you ignore all the core states and just look at the conduction bands? So the question to ask is, what is the interaction energy scale, and is it likely to mix? the higher energy bands that you are ignoring or the lower energy field bands that you're not. So of course you can say I want to include all the bands, you know, from uh, the deepest core state out to the boondocks. And then your control on the calculation and so on will become much worse and all your estimates will become much worse the more that. So I think this is a general statement that uh, why do we think, no, not, not, maybe not everyone will agree, but most people will agree that the cube rate problem, even though not fully solved, everyone will agree that it's a one band problem. Okay? And at worst, you may say that that's a three band problem, but you know, because of the coppers and the two oxygens or something like that. But I can't give you a general answer to this question. But I think the problem with the paper you're referring to, and I'm very happy to talk to you, is of course, if you take humongous interaction scales, you'll mix other things. There's absolutely no... Uh, uh, so you think this mostly the fact that they are introducing a very large uh, yes. interaction scale? 
Yes. But on the other hand, there could be, like when you have very flat bands, especially in um, model systems, okay? And when I say flat bands, let me assume totally dispersionless bands. So if you, this happens in many like lead lattice, dice lattice, Kagome lattice, and so on. This flat band doesn't come alone. This flat band comes with a manifold of bands in all of these systems. Then, uh, if you just focus on the flat band, you will really get a very wrong answer to the superfluid density is zero, because d2 epsilon k d k squared for that flat band is zero. But actually, since it's part of this low energy manifold band, the superfluid density is non-zero. And you must consider all of those. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a general question. So in BCS theory, we have the idea that the, the, we can at least estimate an upper bound for the onset of dissipation through the inferring energy, which is the to the yes. Now, would that change in this kind of view? For example, how does the onset of dissipation work in quite a thing that you say? So, uh, I think the thing is, the superconducting pieces, is if you're, when you say onset of dissipation, you're at zero field, zero current, and you're asking for when does dissipation appear at, as a function of temperature. Is that the question you're asking? No, no. The question is more with the current, but probably, let's talk about our vortices. So, what will be the, the okay. other first? So, actually, nothing that I've said here rigorously applies to something at, say, zero temperature, but turning on magnetic field or turning on a current. So, I'm not prepared to give you any bounds on that state. All I have told you about is that zero field, zero current, what happens as you raise temperature? <coughs> but that's a very interesting question you ask. I just don't have any uh, new answers to that beyond what's known. So if I start in the spirit of the conference of a purely electronic problem, yes. Uh, so I ignore the kinetic energy of the ions. Yes. Then it is rigorous that the only kinetic energy term is the p squared over 2m term of the electrons. Right. In some periodic potential, I'm taking all the bands, everything formally with. Uh, if I then I could use the following exact same logic that you just do. Yes. How bad is that bound? It will be very bad because, because of all the bands that are. That's out. right. Yeah. So it will give you a very high upper bound. Mm -hmm. And then what you should try to do is, if you want to play that game, is to ask how that upper bound changes as you change the cutoff. It's a very interesting question. So at least since this was the opening salvo in this, we have not addressed this. I mean, because of... Uh, yes, it is exactly related to it. Yeah, the question that you asked. Yeah, I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, you imagine there are upper bound of TC in 2D case. Yes. And uh, you also discussed the multi band case. Yes. So the multi band help increase uh, TC or...? Uh, this is help increase TC relative to what? Sorry, I, 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 it helps increase DC relative to what? To the one band case? Oh, okay. Which is the uh, we can reach uh, upper bound? So, so I, I don't know how to compare it. Uh, but we, so you were saying? Uh, yeah, but what about yeah. to, to help increase TC over? It, it could. Is, it could definitely lead to an increase in TC over uh, 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 single band for the reasons that I was discussing with Seamus. For instance, one can look up models where a single band is so flat that its TC is ridiculously low because of that, but there are other bands that allow you to raise TC. Yeah? Okay. Okay, please just uh, the sun's here.